everyone, and welcome to episode 148 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. In this third year of the podcast, I'm very lucky that I haven't got a lot of complaints so far, but if I do get one complaint, it tends to be that I recommend too many books. So if you're one of the people who thinks I recommend too many books and that you're just getting overwhelmed on your bookshelves with all the great books, this may not be the episode for you because what I'm going to be doing this episode is doing a bit of a roundup of some of the latest books that have come out in medieval studies that I'm not going to be centering podcasts on specifically. So what happens is publishing houses often send me books. And if you're a publishing house, please feel free to do that because I love that. I tend to put the best books on the podcast and feature them if I think they are ones that audience will enjoy or they're topics that we need to talk more about publicly, have a bigger discussion about. Sometimes I get sent books that are essay collections that seem a little bit too academic or they're books about things that I've already done a podcast on. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Some of the books that I've been sent, but they're not going to be a full podcast. Some of these books are essay collections, so they are aimed at an academic audience, but not all of them are. So if you are not an academic, I still have some good suggestions for you, especially right at the end. So we're going to be talking about some of the newest books right after this. So here we go. Let's talk about some books that are new. Before I get into this, I should mention that when publishers send me books, I'm under no obligation ever to talk about them. So if a publisher sends me a book, I never have a contractual obligation to talk about it. So I only ever talk about books that I like or think are good. If I don't like it or I think it might be dubious, I don't talk about it at all. So you can trust that the books that I'm talking about are ones that I have independently looked at and made a decision on my own. Whether that is something that that makes these books more appealing to you or less, I mean, I will leave that up to you. But these are books that I independently look at and review. So this is all coming from my own head. There's no contractual obligation there. So the first book I want to talk about today is one of these essay collections. So it is aimed at an academic audience. I figure anytime you have the word epistemology in it, it is not aimed at a general audience. And that's all right. It's a great collection of essays, and it's talking about a very important poem. So this book is called The Roman de la Rose, or The Romance of the Rose, and 13th Century Thought. It's edited by Jonathan Morton and Marco Nievergelt with John Marinbon. Again, this is a collection of essays that are dedicated to the poem, The Romance of the Rose, which is really, really famous and important. It was one that influenced a lot of different poets, definitely at the time, a lot of thinking. I think it exists still in something like 300 manuscripts or more. So a very influential poem. But this particular book is not a translation of the poem. It's not looking at the poem itself, but looking at the influence of the poem. So this is what the introduction says this book is about. It says, rather than concentrating on what the Roman de la Rose became, we want to explore how it came about and how it responded to and intervened in the intellectual environment of its composition. The particular context, the clerical and Latinate academic world of the 1260s and 1270s, whose center was the University of Paris, is that of Jean de Meun, the more significant of the two authors. So this poem is was started by a guy named Guillaume de Lory, and it was finished by Jean de Meun. And Christine de Pizan, who we're going to be talking about later, had quite a lot to say about the poem. So this particular book is very cool in that it talks about this important poem, its place in intellectual thought and philosophical thought of the time. But what is also very cool about this book is there are scholars from different language traditions whose work is translated into English in this book so that you can access people who are studying this work through their own languages, their own mother tongues, but you can read it in English. So if you only speak English, you can still access these scholars' work, which I think is really important. So that is one for people who are interested in how people were thinking about this particular poem in the Middle Ages itself. On a similar theme is another book of essays called Machaut's Legacy, The Judgment Poetry Tradition in the Later Middle Ages and Beyond, which is edited by R. Barton Palmer and Bert Kimmelman. And this is one that is also about a poet who was very influential in the Middle Ages. So for the people who are studying French poetry and even music, 
Here's the quick blurb on who Guillaume de Machaut was from their preface. Guillaume de Machaut was beyond a doubt the most celebrated writer of late medieval France, while his cultural influence, which extended to England and amazing productivity, were rivaled only by Christine de Pizan. Machaut's reputation rested on his authorship of an immense and varied corpus of works, many of which were composed for and in honor of the several grand nobles with whose courts he was at various times associated. It also talks about his contributions to music. So again, this book is very, very specific to one poet, and it talks in three parts, essays collected in three parts. The first one about political and literary authorities, the place of judgment, so the judgment that is being conducted within the poems, what does this mean, where does it come from? The second one, adaptations and appropriations, and the third section is about his legacy. So for people who are interested in French poetry and the analysis of it, this is a good book for you to look at. For people who are interested in learning more about Machaut, who is again another a really famous and influential French poet, this one is a good one for you. This is one that I really wanted to have a podcast based around, but I realized it's kind of too difficult without the visuals. This is a critical companion to English map by Mundi of the 12th and 13th centuries, and it's edited by Dan Turkla and Nick Malaya. So this is a book that is all about English maps of the world. And this is a fascinating topic, how people conceptualize the world. What does it look like? You've probably seen some of these online where you have a round world and it's got Jesus's head at the top, and it's got his feet at the bottom, it's got Jerusalem in the center, or maybe you saw a map that is used or was used for this podcast's logo where the world is drawn sort of like a T. This book really gets into the details about how these decisions were made, who made these decisions. It gets into what the script that was chosen meant. It has all sorts of information about really specific English maps. And I absolutely adore this book, but I figure it could be too difficult on a podcast to say, okay, picture this, <laughs> picture this map. It's got writing that looks kind of like this. It's pretty much too specific for a podcast, but it's absolutely fabulous if you are teaching maps or studying maps yourself. It's just so detailed. It tells you everything that you could possibly want to know about each of these maps. It also has color plates, of course, because to talk about these in detail, you need to have a good representation of it. So again, I absolutely adore this book. Ultimately decided it would be too difficult for a podcast, but I really do want to recommend it to you. And I finally have the opportunity to do that. So A Critical Companion to English Map by Mundi. Very, very cool book. It's thick as a brick and it's got all sorts of information in it. So I recommend this one definitely to people who are interested in mapping and conceptualizing the medieval world, especially people who are interested in English Map by Mundi because that is what this particular book focuses on. Coming back around to books that are mainly focused on an academic audience, we have Scripting the Nation, Court Poetry and the Authority of History in Late Medieval Scotland by Catherine H. Terrell or Terrell. I'm not sure how she pronounces it. So this is a book that talks about Scottish identity and it talks about it in terms of the words of Scots themselves who are writing. And I think Obviously, this is a really important topic, and I do want to do more stuff about Scotland specifically. I have some things up my sleeve, so don't despair if you've been waiting for that. It will happen eventually, but I do have to get a hold of the right people and get this all scheduled. But this book is one that I think is better to read than to have on the podcast itself because it is so specifically based on the words that these poets have written. So you have to kind of say, okay, this is what they've said. And here's how we interpret what they've said. So it can be very specific. And I think it could be confusing in an audio format. <laughs> so this is one that I wanted to bring to you. And I think it would be good for you to read it instead of perhaps listen to it. So from the blurb on the back, you can see it says, Terrell's excellent study examines how the Scottish writers marked out a distinct realm of Scottish cultural and poetic achievement, appropriating and subverting English literary models in ways that reveal the interplay between literary and historical authority in the scripting of nationhood. So we've talked about this before in terms of the way people use words to build their own identity. I think we were talking, I was talking with Amy Jeffs about this when she was talking about how people used 
their own interpretation of history to build a Scottish identity that was separate from English identity. This book follows that tradition, but again, very, very specific to the wording that is used by specific poets. So if you are somebody who's learning about Scotland and England and their interactions, and you want to learn more about how these two nations especially Scotland, built identities that were based on and also playing off of English identity, then this is a good book for you. It is Scripting the Nation. Now we are coming to some of my personal favorites because of the subject matter of all the stuff that I've been talking about today, starting with one that is just called Medieval Welsh Medical Texts, Volume 1, The Recipes by Diana Luft. And As you know, I absolutely love medical recipes. I love them for all sorts of reasons. I feel like they can tell us a lot about society, what people were concerned with, as well as the plants they had access to, the way they would mix things up, the method for all of these things, how people learned about medicine, how they applied it. I think all of this stuff is super, super fascinating. So of course, I love this one, but it seems like a lot of the backstory behind the manuscripts that make this up can be a little bit murky. So I thought it would be unfair to bring Diana Left on the podcast and just say, hey, remember that one, that one recipe for toothpaste? That might be a little bit unfair. But I do want to give her a lot of credit because like the Trotula, which is a text I talked about with Monica Green on the podcast, it looks like the texts that make up this particular collection of medical recipes were conflated and they were brought together and they were thought of as one unit of texts. And so Diana Left has done a lot of work to pull these apart and tell you where they came from individually, each of the texts that she's using to inform this. She also has huge indexes that tell you about what the individual plants are, how they apply to each recipe, what manuscripts they are in, which ones they're not in. It tells you about what the Welsh words for these are. And another thing that is really quite amazing about this book is it has actual Welsh for you. So if you are a Welsh speaker or a Welsh reader or somebody that wants to get better at your medieval Welsh, you can read the English on one page and the facing page has the medieval Welsh to read at the same time. I think that is always really useful whenever you have something in translation to have the two translations there so you can read them against each other. I absolutely love that. So University of Wales Press, thumbs up for you. This is a really great book for that reason, among others, of course. And because I can't come across a medical recipe book without actually sharing a medical recipe with you, I will do that for you. I should mention that there are all sorts of really interesting afflictions that are all brought into these medical texts. Everything from pneumonia to heart disease to insect bites to cleaning your teeth. A lot on fever, a lot on gout. It doesn't seem to have as much cosmetic stuff as the trotula does, but a lot of really basic health advice. Although many of the recipes in here are pretty difficult to actually create for yourself. So I'll read you one that is just called For an Affliction. Diana Left has noted this one as possibly being for gout. For an Affliction. Take cat fat and sheep tallow and the juice of the dwarf elder and wild celery and some polypody and black nightshade and common mallow and put them with honey and pitch and new wax and wheat flour and boil them together in a skillet. And after they have boiled well, press them through a linen cloth and put them in a box to keep. And that is good for every pain. So there you go. That's good for every pain. If you just happen to have common mallow, black nightshade, some celery, and some cat fat around, you are good to go. So (laughs) can you see why I adore medieval medicine? It's just amazing. So (laughs) if you are somebody that is interested in medieval medicine or medieval Welsh traditions or a combination of those both together or things like toothpaste in the Middle Ages, this is the book for you. It is Medieval Welsh Medical Texts, Volume 1, The Recipes by Diana Luft. We're going to finish off strong with two books on one of my favorite subjects ever, which is Christine de Pizan. And one of the reasons that I'm featuring these here instead of on a separate podcast is I actually did a podcast on Christine de Pizan. And there are just so many topics on the Middle Ages that I probably shouldn't keep repeating, you know, new episodes on Christine de Pizan, even though I love her. 
So <laughs> the last two books are about her because I still want you to access these books. They are great. The first one is The Book of the Body Politic, which is edited and translated by Angus J. Kennedy. This is actually Christine's book called The Book of the Body Politic in translation. And it's the full book, which I think is amazing because often the clips that I've had are just short. So you can read the whole thing here. So what is the book of the body politic? Well, this is a book that she wrote in the early 15th century when things are just disastrous in French politics. And this is in the tradition of mirrors for princes. So it's advice to a prince, in this case, the Dauphin, Louis, who is only a child at this time, and it is talking about how to govern wisely. So things like how you should be generous, you should pick good counselors, you should listen to the advice of your good counselors, you should pay attention to the three estates of medieval society, here's what they are, here's how you deal with them, talking about pretty much everything from manners to the good things that a prince should know to one section which I think is really <laughs> exciting called on the clever ruses that knights must use in battle. So <laughs> Christine de Pizan is amazing. If you haven't listened to the episode yet, go back and listen to it and you'll find out she's this woman who is widowed and she's writing, she's giving advice to princes, which is pretty amazing, and even giving them advice on military matters, as you can see. So if you want to access Christine's book, I quite like The City of Ladies, which is what I talked about on the previous podcast on Christine, but this one is really interesting too because it shows you how this woman was addressing the really important topics of the time. And it's also really important to look at Christine's words, her own words, to find out how she related to the societal structures, to the societal pressures that were going on around her. Because a lot of people, because Christine is one of the first female professional writers, if not the first in Western Europe, people want to put her in all sorts of boxes. And it's really important to look at her own words and decide for yourself what she is trying to say and how she's trying to say it. So I love new editions of Christine's work. So here's one, The Book of the Body Politic, edited and translated by Angus J. Kennedy. I should mention that that translation is actually very easy to read, and so it's not necessarily for academics. I mean, reading any sort of medieval primary source may seem like an academic activity on its own. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what normal people do, <laughs> but it is just the primary translation itself. So you don't have to be an academic to enjoy that one. And finally, the last book I'm going to talk about, you definitely don't have to be an academic to enjoy it. If you are studying medieval studies, it's still going to be helpful to you because it is basically a biography of Christine de Pizan. So I love this. I love this. It couldn't be better. It's called Christine de Pizan, Life, Work, Legacy by Charlotte Cooper Davis. This tells you as much as we can know about Christine's life. I'll go through the contents for you to give you an idea of what's in here and how it's laid out. There's a visit to Christine de Pizan's Paris, Christine's artistic vision, Christine stems the fountain of misogyny, so how Christine writes back against misogyny, especially the romance of the rose, which is something we talked about earlier today. And finally, Christine's legacy in early modern and modern culture. How is Christine received afterwards? And the answer to that is not very well. <laughs> Initially, a lot of people like Christine, and eventually she just fell out of favor And when it comes to the canon that people were reading. So... What is cool about this book, it's very reader-friendly. I think it's an important book for people to read, especially if they're interested in women's history. It is Women's History Month right now. She is a very interesting figure and a very influential figure in her own time and in her own right. What are some of the things that stand out about this? Well, I think talking about Christine and situating her within Paris is really important so you have an idea of what the period and the specific politics are of the time. But I think perhaps what is the most important chapter for understanding Christine or some of the things that she found most important is the one on her workshop. And this is actually a very important and cool chapter because it does have a full page image of Christine's handwriting. So we know that Christine was really involved in writing her own stuff 
and making sure that was published. She had a hand in how it was illustrated. She had a hand in pretty much every part of the production of her books. And here is a picture of Christine's handwriting, or what we are 99% sure. I don't know if that's overestimating the case. I'd have to look at the actual paper this is based on. But we are really quite sure this is Christine's writing. And so, of course, that's really amazing. It's like looking at that one page that people are pretty sure is Shakespeare's writing too, right? It's very exciting. So of all the books I talked about today, I really would recommend this one to the most people, <laughs> the broadest audience, because I think that it would be really accessible for people who need a biography of Christine and they're working on her. They're just beginning their work on her. But for everybody else, like anyone who walks into a bookstore and picks this up is going to get a lot out of it because of the way that it's written. And I think it's really focused on a general audience. It's a great book and I recommend it. So Christine de Pizan, Life, Work, Legacy by Charlotte Cooper Davis. So that is it for the main meat of the podcast today. I hope that these books are going to be useful to you. Again, I don't want them ever to go to waste when a publisher sends them to me, and I think they are good. I want to share them with you in some way, even if it can't be an entire episode, because for the academic books definitely in this list, they're just kind of too specific for a general audience. And so I wanted to bring them to you so you can have a look for yourself and make sure that you know that they exist. So hopefully you found this a useful episode. And yeah, everybody go read more about Christine de Pisan. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, I've been working on this piece about medieval London and their administration. Like, who does what in a city government? We kind of know that like, there's a mayor and there are aldermen, but there's a whole bunch of officials that do little things like the scavengers. And that their job is actually to clean the streets. And so I'm looking at this kind of a new translation of a 14th century work talking about what uh, the duties are of all these officials. So I'm trying to put that together. I'm hopefully I'm going to get this out within the next week or so, which I think is kind of pretty cool. And have your little guide to city politics in medieval London. I think that's great because I think that is hard information to find when you're trying to figure out what the city structure is. There's a lot of stuff out there, I think, where you can find out what a monastic structure is or what the hierarchy is and the nobility. But actual municipal structure, I find is is hard to find. So this is going to be great when, when yeah, that gets up. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I'm working on that. Plus, we've got a bunch of articles. We have Adam Alley on this revolt in 6th century Middle East. And Catherine Walton is writing on women writers from medieval England. It's uh, Women's History Month in March. So she has that for us. That sounds great. That sounds great. I love when you have a whole survey of new stuff that covers a whole bunch of topics and regions. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we always try to have like a really nice variety on Medievalist.net. So I'm always really happy to have that over a few posts. It's always fun. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks, Peter. See you next week. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to all the Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. You'll find amazing stuff for patrons like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, a book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. And you also get to feel good about helping Medievalist.net's podcasters to keep bringing you fun historical content, including that of yours truly. So thank you. For all the details, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from books to battles, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day. Bye.